Hi, good morning, Facebook community. My name is Angel Ellers, and I'd like to welcome you to today's nice, brisk, 35 degree weather and our winter animal tracks program brought to you virtually today by environmental educator Christopher Ricker. And we will get to him in just a moment as we wait for a few more people to sign on. And I'll tell you exactly where we are also. We are on the Nature Center Trail. I'll show you what those trailblazes look like. You see this big N, white N inside of a blue rectangle that tells you whenever you see that, that you are along the one mile loop that goes around the back of the Greenbelt Nature Center that is on Rockland Avenue. So along that loop, if you're coming back down toward the parking lot, toward the bridge, if you're familiar, maybe toward the end of your really nice mile long, maybe half an hour, 45 minute hike, you may have seen these markings before. There's an, two E's, right? And so this kind of trailblaze is telling you that we're gonna go make a turn in that direction. And this one actually is marking a really special trail that you may have walked, it's very small, and it is the trail that is traditionally used for early education hikes in the Greenbelt. So the educators would come around, bring preschoolers, kindergartners, even younger, on this nice small loop because there's so much to be seen. So I've made my right turn, and I see our environmental educator, Christopher Ricker, now. So let's say hi. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to yet another Greenbelt at Home virtual program. As Angel mentioned, today's program will be winter animal tracks. And if you pan around, you'll notice that there isn't any snow on the ground. Overall, the ground is pretty hard packed because of the colder temperatures. But nevertheless, our forested landscape is full of different signs, sounds, smells, and things that can tell us about the animals that call this space home. Now, many of you might have visited the Greenbelt in person or virtually, and sometimes we see wildlife physically, and sometimes we don't. But just because there's an absence of visually seeing wildlife doesn't mean that they're not there. And so today's program will help us gain some of the skills and insights into reading the landscape so that we can better understand some of the animals that live here. Because animals are adapted to be inconspicuous at times, especially in human presence. So by looking around for signs, smells, scratches, we can read this landscape and see a picture of what's going on. And so the first sign that I noticed today was on this sapling. If you look over here, you'll notice that a lot of the bark, which is the outer layer of the tree, is missing. It's been all scratched up. Looks like it's having a little bit of a rough time. There's some bark peeling up towards the top of it. And you might just pass this and not really think twice about these two saplings or this half a little stump over here with some more scratchings. And again, the bark looks like it's been shredded up into sort of like a hair, right? All these fibers are hanging off. And what that's telling us is not only are there animals in the area, but specifically there are male deer, also known as bucks. So bucks will come over to sapling trees of various sizes, and they'll take their big antlers and they'll scratch them up and down along saplings and younger trees. And sometimes it does kill the tree. Sometimes the tree is able to heal. But what the bucks or male deer are doing is two things. Certain times of year, they're taking their antlers and they're rubbing it and rubbing it along here because their antlers have something known as velvet on it. And that velvet gets really itchy, kind of like if you have a scab on your skin and you really, really want to pick it. The buck comes over and he rubs it on there and that gets the velvet layer off. And then that itch kind of goes away. Secondly, bucks will also rub 
their antlers and heads against these trees to put their scent on it, to mark territory, to communicate with other deer, whether it be does, female deer, or other bucks in the area. So if I was a wildlife biologist and I was studying deer populations on Staten Island, I'd be able to know just by this sign that there are male deer in the area. So again, not always tracks or footprints in the snow, but sometimes they can be things like marks on trees where rubbings have occurred. Again, some other signs besides footprints itself, which hopefully we'll see on this hike, are things like scat, poop, right? You can tell a lot about life by what poop is going on. Also things like bedding, scrapes, scratches, even smells. Sometimes you can smell wildlife. And also looking for homes. If you go to our Staten Island Greenbelt YouTube channel, you'll find a really awesome video from Angel about squirrel homes, which also is a great resource and skill when thinking about wildlife. So in that video, Angel talked about tree cavities. And here we have a tree cavity at the base of this tree. And what I notice in particular is all of this material down in here. Some of it's super wet and decomposed. Some of it's a little bit drier. And so what that's telling me is something, whether it's a rodent like a squirrel or a chipmunk, whether it's beetles, whether it's some other animal that I'm not sure of, I know that something is going up there and moving up into the hollow of this tree, which is causing this to come down. Sometimes animals like beetles are eating and helping to break down the tree. Sometimes it's just an animal scurrying up, causing some loose stuff to come down. But either way, I know that something is dwelling and moving up inside of this tree. And as Angel pans up, right, sometimes we spend so much time looking down at the ground that we lose signs of tracking up above us. And for anyone just joining us right now, welcome. We have environmental educator Christopher Ricker showing us some of the various different animal signs and tracks that you might see in the Greenbelt in winter. There's something else we like to look at when we're looking for signs of wildlife is within the vegetation itself. And when we pan around, there's not a whole lot of green out here for the most part because it is winter. But what green does remain are these briars, these green briars here which are thorny and a little pokey, right? You wouldn't want to rub up into that. But throughout this entire briar patch, we'll notice that a lot of the briar is around the same height and that the top of all this briar has been chomped on. And it's safe to assume that deer, as they're foraging for winter, looking for what food remains, that they have no problem chomping on this briar. And though I wouldn't want to stick this in my mouth and chomp on it because of those thorns, deer are adapted with really strong grinding teeth so that they aren't necessarily as affected by it if, say, someone like me chewed on it. But with that said, you notice that they're only nibbling on the tops. They're not getting down into the thicker base where the thorns are probably at their most potent strong uh, stages, right? The further down on the plant, the thicker the stem and the thicker the thorns. So that's a little bit of, you know, nutrition for them during the harder winter months. I'm sure in the summer when there's a plethora of plants, they would prefer to chomp on other things, but that's telling us that there's not just a buck in the area, there's probably a whole lot of deer hanging out in this part of the green belt. Right, 
Angel just pointed out that we have a big rotting tree here. And on top of this tree, we notice that there's a nut. And this nut has been cut in half and some of it's been eaten. Some of, it is, some of it's been left there. So as we're walking around looking for animal sign, right? We can find something like an acorn or a black walnut. We might find some berry droppings or we might find a cache. Right? So sometimes squirrels will find cavities or chipmunks or other wildlife and they'll cache food away into an area like in here. And so it's a sign not only that they're storing food, but they're also sitting here and probably munching on it. So just like I might stop on a park bench and eat a Nathan's hot dog for a little while, a squirrel or a chipmunk might have found this little bench to sit on, come here and have their lunch. They're also up higher so they can get a nice view as they're eating. So they're continuously looking out for signs for predators or threats. So by being up a little bit higher, they can munch, look around, and then if someone like a human or a dog on a leash or even a larger um, animal, a predator like a fox or a bird of prey comes by, they can quickly get into the underbrush. And having all this briar here, right, that's a really great way for them to conceal themselves and protect themselves from predators. Hiking trails are really great for viewing wildlife and wildlife signs and tracking because even though wildlife wants to conceal themselves out amongst the vegetation and trees, you know, camouflage themselves against different backdrops, wildlife also enjoys using corridors, whether it's a game trail, which is a trail that's created continuously by wildlife movement, or a human trail. Right? There's a path of least resistance, and so wildlife will continuously use human corridors as well as wildlife corridors. And what that allows us to do is as we're looking down on our trail, we can look for different scrapes, scratches, or footprints. And if we look down, we notice that the leaf litter is disturbed in a couple spots. We can't necessarily tell what made that right now. It could have been a dog, it could have been a human, could have been a deer. But either way, it is some signs. And if we moved along further, we might find some other signs that can help us create a hypothesis of what is going on in the area. Now, when we pan off the trail here, we can see kind of an open space. And it's open because a lot of the vegetation has gone to sleep for the winter, but I know from coming on the e-trail before that I've seen a lot of deer activity in here. So I just want to take us off the beaten path for a short moment to explore what's going on over here. And something I noticed looking down is that there is some disturbance in the leaf here and it's not a deer track and it's not scat but what we notice is that there's a ridge underneath the ground that's moving kind of like a road looks a lot like rockland avenue but in a little mini form and it's subterranean or fossorial right so it's underneath the ground and something is creating that so I think it's safe to assume that something like a mole is creating a mole trail under the ground as it's exploring its subterranean labyrinth looking for worms and grubs and other tasty things that are under the ground. So as a visitor or as a wildlife biologist, I can check off, yes, there's moles or voles or shrews living in the green belt.
another sign over here as we're looking down at the ground is one of my favorite signs, which is scat or poop. So we have some right there. And you can see this is probably a couple days old, could be a couple weeks old because it's it's dried up. It's pretty hard. Over here there's some more scat. And instead of being bundled up in one thing, it's more of that traditional pellets separated. They kind of look like milk duds. They have an oval shape. They're a dark, rich color. And I know from the size and from the area that this scat belongs to white-tailed deer. And scat's really important as someone who's trying to track wildlife and see what's going on because it tells us what animals in the area. If we decide to play with the poop, which you should never do unattended by adults or with gloves, but the poop can tell us what is actually inside of the diet of a particular animal. Deer scat in particular I find really interesting because fawns, which are baby deer, will not poop within the area that they hide. So as a young fawn, at times their mother, a doe, will leave them to forage for food and to do what mother deer do. And while the fawns are hiding, they need to not only camouflage their bodies, but they also need to camouflage their scents. So what it said is that does will actually move their fawns away from a resting area to poop. And they actually stimulate the fawns to poop while they're nursing off of the mother. That way, if a predator, like a coyote, uh, is coming in an area where there might be a fawn, the coyote isn't smelling the scat within the area which I think is really cool and a really awesome adaptation to think about how animals also at times try to hide their signs. If you peek over here, we'll also notice that there's kind of a bald patch in the leaf litter. And this is some sort of scraping. A lot of different animals will scrape. Sometimes turkeys, as they're moving along through a forest, will scrape looking for things to eat. Sometimes deer will scrape in order to leave scent. Uh, so there's a lot of different wildlife that will scrape up the underbrush looking for stuff. Even uh, predators, which we don't have things like bear, coyote, or mountain lions here. But some of those animals will also scrape up either the earth or trees to leave scent or to look for food. And so since we know we don't have things like bears, uh, or mountain lions on Staten Island. We again, in theory, can guess this is probably related to the other deer sign that we're seeing around here. And again, as a reminder for everyone who is just tuning in now, welcome to our winter animal track program here on the E-Trail near the Greenbelt Nature Center with environmental educator Christopher Ricker. So what I'm trying to look for is a deer bed, but the challenge here, again, as I mentioned earlier, is that we are in the winter months. So a lot of this grass that kind of looks like straw now, right? Later in the year, you'll see a lot more of it during the spring and summer months. And when that grass is up and high, you'll find big sections that have been kind of trampled down. And then as the deer pulls in for the night to go to sleep, that deer is gonna leave an impression in the grass and so I'm sure if we explored for an hour or so we'd probably find a lot of deer beds in this area but just thinking about what you could be looking for as you're exploring the green belt or outdoor spaces within your community areas where there's a lot of tall grass is a really great place to look for deer bed sign or other wildlife bedding signs
And I think, did you find some more poop? Uh, it looks like some more scat. And that scat looks a little bit smaller than the scat we saw before. And I don't know poop well enough to say it's not a deer, it's probably a deer. But there's other animals that have round little uh, balls for their scat. Which again is telling us that it's probably a herbivore of some sort. Whether it's small little pellets from a rabbit or big oval pellets from a deer. Um, some people like to say that there's a difference between buck droppings and doe droppings, but most wildlife biologists will say that there's no huge difference between those two scats. But if this was something longer and tubular, maybe with some hair in it, right, we might think, hmm, what could be something that is leaving scat with hair in it? And that's probably something that's an omnivore or a predator that's eating other wildlife. Um, here, if we were to break open these little pellets, we'd probably find a lot of vegetation inside of them from the plants that the deer and or rabbit had been eating. And again, it's all about looking around, looking for signs, being quiet to help because as you're exploring looking for different animal finds, you might ultimately come across the animal you're looking for. It's so cool to think that all these animal signs we've seen so far in our hike have been within viewing of the early childhood or environmental trail. So you don't have to go deep, deep into the green belt or deep into the Catskills or the Adirondacks to track animals during the winter months. You can take a car or a bus ride right to the Greenbelt Nature Center on Rockland Avenue and explore all of these signs within what, like a three minute walk. And if we take a second just to listen, sometimes using our other senses help. I hear people. I hear cars, but I also hear some bird chirps in the trees. Now, though my foggy glasses don't allow me to see them right now, I know they're there through their sign that they're making by chirping. So different sounds also tell us different things, right? Sometimes we hear blue jays screaming in the trees because they're aware of our presence or the presence of a predator. I hear some people that were laughing and cheering, so I know that they're having a really good time on the Nature Center Trail today. So besides the visuals, besides smelling, because sometimes you can smell the musk of a deer as it takes off in the underbrush, you can also hear signs of wildlife. And I see some more poop. So, again, poop is a natural thing and it tells us a lot about what's going on. And so, this might look like a little bit of white paint, maybe from someone painting trailblazers, but it's not. This looks like some bird poop. So maybe you own a car or maybe your parents own a car and sometimes in the morning you might find some white bird scat on the windshield. 
But when we're out here, that's telling us that there's a bird at one point or another perched up above us, whether it was looking for food, whether it was looking for a place to rest, and left us a note to tell us that it was here. Whoa, an angel just found, it looks like a cicada wing. Might be from a season or two ago. Great eyes, Angel. So this was down in the leaf litter. So maybe, just maybe, that bird who took that little scat right there might have been eating a cicada at the moment. So finding carrion, which are dead things or remains, whether it be chunks of hair or feathers, blood, that can tell us what's going on. And we can paint a picture in our mind of what that wildlife was doing at any given time. It's always great to have Angel filming these tracking things because she has elven eyes. She can see a lot better than I can see with my glasses fogging up <laughs> during these winter months. So. We are now coming back onto the Nature Center Trail, off of the E Trail, and you can see that these trails intercept and people are out hiking along them. And so we physically see a dog now, right? But what if we came by 20, 30 minutes later and we didn't see that beautiful dog on a leash? How would we know it's there? Well, as we're walking along the trail, we can look for signs. Maybe there's some scratching, off to the sides of the trail. Maybe if it's a little bit muddier, we can find tracks, right? There are some disturbances here. They're a little bit older. That looks like that could be a deer hoof because of the shape. It's rounded down here, kind of came to a point, but it's not fresh by any means, but it is a track and there are different tracks based on different animals. Human beings, which probably make the most amount of tracks on our trails, right? Walk bipedal, right? We have two legs. And so I'm just gonna step over here so these other hikers can pass us. But we can continue to look down for tracks as we're moving along. And again, deer or sheep, elk, things with hooves are gonna leave undulate <coughs> grades. And over here we can see a paw and some toe pads, right? So we know that that's probably the dog that just passed here, especially since there's wet mud. And a dog track is gonna look different than say a squirrel track. So humans and dogs and cats walk one foot in front of the other and it kind of makes a zigzag, zig, zag, where something like a squirrel or a chipmunk or a rabbit is gonna make more of a hop or a jump where they're gonna move and they're gonna land on all fours. Sometimes their front feet are gonna come before their rear and vice versa. So that's more of a hop track versus that zigzag pattern. And again, humans land with their heels and the front of their foot, and they're placing their entire foot down. Where something like a cat, a feline, or a canine, they're gonna land on those pads. And then again, if you were a deer, you're gonna land on your hooks. So and you're going to have different locomotion and as you get better with tracks and reading track signs you're going to be able to figure out what the animal is doing was it running was it meandering slowly was it just walking and again by buying a really great tracker book utilizing resources online or visiting some of our virtual programs that we offer here at the green belt you can gain those skills and who knows, maybe you're going to surpass the skills that we have here as Greenbelt Environmental Educators. So, 
we're back to our starting point so i want to thank you for joining me for this animal uh winter animal tracks and i hope to see you again on another program have a good one we are right back where we started at the very same tree and again i'd just like to thank you all for joining us today and remind you that we do have a list of virtual programs that we will offer throughout January. That list is available at the calendar at our website at sigreenbelt.org. We also have a YouTube channel which has lots of videos of crafts and environmental education and hikes and virtual programs. And that is the Staten Island Greenbelt. And of course you know about our Facebook pages, the Greenbelt Conservancy, Greenbelt Education, as well as our Instagram account. So check us out. We're so happy to continue to offer virtual programming even during this time. So thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.